test. Hello, everyone. Uh, whoops, I need to turn this one off. Okay. Uh, my name is Michael Snyder, and I am a hacker. Yeah. Been a hacker for a long, long time. Okay. And I study magnetism. Uh, about 15 years ago, I was in IT, and I was an MCSE. MCSE, and I was also a CCSP, and I kind of got bored, and uh, it was after Silicon Valley kind of crashed, and I went back to college, and I started studying physics, and that's what I do now. I'm a physicist, and also a hacker. Okay. Uh, what is magnetism? Will Pig actually gave me this topic. I think he picked it out of thin air, and I said, okay, I can do that. So it's going to take a little bit of time. Uh, we're going to feel free to ask questions. Uh, is there anybody that studies quantum mechanics in the room? Good. <laughs> I, I don't want to cause anybody any undue mental stress. Uh, is there anybody that studies chemistry? Cool. I, I'll have a few slides for that later, too. Okay, let's just get started. Okay, this is my outline. What is a, what is a dipole? It's two poles of charges. We'll go through that. Part one, what is magnetism? Quantum spin is the mother of all magnetism. Part two, uh, modeling of magnetism, and that's direct Coulomb summation. That's what I do. And part three is viewing magnetism. And that's the uh, ferro fluid cells that you saw last year. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'll just add some more slides to what I did last year. OK, what is a dipole? It's two poles or charges. Now, one thing should be noticed here is I can answer this question very easily. But I can't answer what is a pole. I'm going to turn this off. I keep hearing feedback. Try again. Okay, what is a dipole? It's two poles or charges. Now, well, I can't answer what is a pole. Uh, it would take all day. But I can explain what is a dipole. This is a bar magnet. I have two poles. I have a north pole and I have a south pole. And these two poles give us our traditional magnetism. And of course, we have iron filings around, this, around the magnet, and these are called traditionally your B-field lines. Okay, breaking a magnet. If we take a magnet and we break it in half, we go from two poles to four poles. And if we break it again, then we go from four poles to eight poles. So magnetism, basically every time you break it, it gets weaker, but you gain more poles. So that should be some basic stuff that we would do in the high school. Uh, notice that you can keep going and going and going, but at a certain point, you, it will stop, and at that point, it's called a magnetic domain. And this is pictures of two magnetic domains. It's in the nanometer range. On the left-hand side is a cobalt film that's uh, in a zero applied field. So basically, the magnetic domains go randomly and self-cancel the poles. On the right-hand side, we have an applied field. So the cobalt film is aligning itself. And we can imagine that each one of these little tracks going left to right is a dipole. So we have, we have a, like a south pole, a north pole, a space, a south pole, a north pole, a space, a south pole, a north pole, a space. It sounds like a dance, doesn't it? Uh, 
So one thing to realize is that this magnetism on the right-hand side is ordered. This magnetism on the left-hand side is disordered. It's still magnetism. Now, I can give a little demonstration. OK, I have a magnet. It's pretty strong uh, as magnets go. If I break it apart and drop it in this little two liter container I have, magnetism will disorder and it will go into the lowest energy configuration. So what I had was a strong magnet. Now what I have is disordered random magnets. Now this field has greatly dropped. It's still there. There's still a leakage field. But earlier, if you could have detected this field at the end of the room, at the back of the room, now you can't because it's canceled itself out. Now, how do I make a permanent magnet? Well, what I would do is I would take a very strong magnetic field and apply it to this, and it would straighten itself out. It would align itself. And then I would pour epoxy in here and let the epoxy set, and that would be a permanent magnet. All Permanent magnets are made this way. It's at a nano level, but it's the same thing. We align dipoles, uh, neodymium magnets, for example. We align dipoles. We heat the material. We let it cool be below the Curie temperature, and it becomes a magnet until you re reheat it or break it again, and uh, you lose some, some domains uh, alignment. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, one of the biggest magnets that we know of, Earth. We have a North Pole and we have a South Pole. Uh, I think everybody agrees that Earth is a magnet. It's also a dipole. Uh, now, in, later on in the presentation, I'm going to be doing some modeling. And this is the model I use. I have a North Pole. I have a South Pole. I have a center of mass. So that looks just like the Earth. There's no accident here. That's basically where this model comes from. OK. Now let's jump to quantum mechanics. This is an electron in uh, quantum mechanics. On the left-hand side is spin down. On the right-hand side is spin up. Notice that they, they don't have a magnetic field here. They don't have a north pole and a south pole. What they have is mu, which is a magnetic moment. Now, what happened to these poles? Well, nothing happened. They're, they're still there. Around 1900, we stopped doing classical mechanics, and we started doing, well, say 1910, 1920, we started doing quantum mechanics. Well, quantum mechanics, it turns out that this magnetic vector is a uh, magnetic moments a lot easy, a lot easier to calculate than keeping up with two lo charge locations, two pole locations. So we switched over to magnetic moments. My point is you can always go back and forth. If you have a magnetic moment, you have a magnetic field. If you have a dipole, you can do the math and create a magnetic moment. So notice that how the uh, model works. So even though we're not showing it, there is a North Pole, there is a South Pole, and we have a center of charge in this case. Okay. Now we're going to let this movie play for about three or four minutes, and I want to take any questions. Is there any questions so far? Yes, uh, a magnetic moment is a vector space before you start but you can always add more to it. So is it an entire space, or is it a particular vector, like singular or, or is it within a set? It is a direction of 3D space. OK, so, but it's a single, a single point in 3D space, right? Or I don't have an answer to that. Okay. Uh, by definition, a dipole has to have spacing. Right. And the magnetic moment is calculated from the dipole. So Yes, absolutely. Stop. Okay, any question? Uh, any other questions? What accounts for the difference in, in strength? Like you have a hard drive magnet or your microwave magnet versus this. What is going on there? There's 
two different things going on. One is scale. You know, you have a nanoscale, you have a micro world scale, you have a galaxy scale. So dipoles can be strong or weak depending on the material itself. But when you go all the way down to the electron, the electron has a set dipole moment or a magnetic moment. So the more electrons that you have aligned in a certain direction, and remember there's lots and lots of electrons in material. You know, 6.22 times 10 to the 23rd uh, atoms per mole. And you can do the math for the number of electrons. So we're talking a huge number. If, on average, most of the electrons face a certain direction, then you have magnetism. And, you know, different materials have a different ratio of alignments that's possible. Does that answer your question? Any more? Right. Right. I agree. And it seems to me that contradicts what um, the idea of, of electronic We, I will, I will address that in a later slide. Uh, your initial conception there is correct, but there's a little bit missing, and I'll, I'll add it to it. Okay. Uh, this is my modeling. Each one of these models are not one dipole string. It's millions and millions and millions of dipole strings. I use uh, NVIDIA CUDA cards. I program in the CUDA language. I literally have a uh, array, 321 by 321 by 321, and that's 33 million points. So I'm calculating for every frame in this video, 33 million points, then I'm sending it to a program called POV Ray, and POV Ray is showing it uh, what the field looks like. Yes. So basically, I'm taking this huge data set of vectors, I said, POV Ray, please just show me this, and this is what it shows me. The different colors are different potential energies. Uh, I'm a physicist, I like potential energy. The white dots are showing us the B field lines. And we'll, we'll show different configurations. Oh. Back, well, let's just go back. B field. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. So the white dots are basically, no, there's another name for that. It's also called streamline. Right. So in vector space, if you have a streamline, it looks very much like a magnetic field. So that's how I actually calculate that. Okay, we'll go to the next section. Part one, what is magnetism? Quantum spin is the mother of all magnetism. And here's some big claims, but I can back most of these up. Electrons, protons, neutrons are fermions. That means they have a quantum spin of one half. You and the person next to you, and the person next to you, that person, remain a fermions. Now, it just happens to be that all fermions have a magnetic moment based on uh, uh, quantum mechanics. And it just happens, whoops, let me, yeah, I said that correctly. And it just happens that all fermions have quantum spin. Now, there is a relationship here, but it's, most people never say the obvious thing. Magnetism equals quantum spin. They're directly related. If that's true, then you have to prepare it to be able to measure for the initial. When you're, when you're measuring quantum spin, you have to prepare it for the state before you can measure. Well, and how, how does that how does that work? You know, I actually work backwards. Yeah. All fermions have magnetic moments. Therefore, all fermions have magnetism. Magnetism, and then also all fermions have a spin of one half. So, so these two relationships must have some kind of correlation. Okay. Now you actually hit on something. If I put that on a test, you know, I'm in grad school. If I put that on a test, they would fail me. You have to say it a certain way. You can say that magnetism and quantum spin are functions of each other, and then they give you a passing grade. No, that seems kind of silly, doesn't it? You know, it's it's. 
Well, the, no, the function, uh, no, well, I, I don't have time to explain functions, but basically if you have one thing, you don't get uh, Here's an example. Superman and Clark Kent are functions of each other. Are they the same? Think about that. Well, I mean, <laughs> cool. Okay. Where do we, where do we find magnetism? The answer is everywhere. It's all around us. Uh, and here's the proof. Okay, four, four forces of nature. Gravity, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, and electric magnetic force. That's your only choices. And these have been agreed on. This is a standard model. There, there's no fifth force. There's no sixth force. This is it. Okay, gravity. Gravity is 10 e to the 36 times weaker. Uh, this, you know, 1 over... 10 and 36 zeros, weaker than the electromagnetic force. And here's the standard proof for this. You would see this in any first year class in a college. I have a chair. I have a magnet. The earth is pulling the chair down. The magnet is pulling the chair up. If I do it slower. The magnet beat the whole earth. Think about that. So gravity is very weak. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't affect us because Earth is very big. The sun is very big. The moon's not that big, but it's close to us. Jupiter is huge. It affects us, too. So gravity does affect us, but it's very weak compared to electromagnetic force. OK. Strong nuclear force is inside the nucleus. And without it, we would fly apart. So it's kind of important. The weak nuclear force, oh, it holds the protons and neutrons together. The weak nuclear force, that's decay rates. We all have carbon-14 in our bodies. Carbon-14 decays every 5,000 years on average, half-life. So the weak nuclear force is part of the reason it decays at a certain rate. So they're important, but they don't affect our daily lives. The only remaining force is the electric magnetic force. Everything you've ever done, every, anything you'll ever dream about, involves electric magnetic force. Uh, let's see. I have a little demonstration. The force, Luke, the force. OK. The electrons in my hand, or I have atoms and molecules, and the electrons are going around the atoms and molecules. They are repelling this uh, lightsaber, and that's how I'm holding it. We don't need, I know this, let me see. Those electrons and how they align themselves are holding this whole thing together. And uh, oh, I have a point I'll make in a second. So we don't need some mysterious force to explain the universe or you know to believe in. Just basic electric magnetic force is what more out there than we could ever imagine. Our reality is literally electrons flying around. And remember, every electron has a charge, and every electron has a magnetic field. So that's everything. Uh, I had a question about chemistry. What's the two types of bonds in chemistry? Uh, can you? Ionic and covalent. Can you show me where that is in here? We have ionic, which would be electric. Covalent has to be, now remember, it's, you're talking about both two things at the same time, but Covalent bonds are based on magnetism. There's no other choice. There's no other way of looking at it. OK. OK. So let's jump into modeling. Uh, we had dipole chain. So a bunch of dipole chains produce a magnet. So this is, this is a bunch of dipole chains. And this here, I'm showing the potential energies. Basically, we have a north-south, north-south, and here's, this is potential energy of the acceleration around the 
be a magnet. When I started doing this modeling, we had did something in like 1910, 1920. We had followed a convention. Nobody wanted to do calculations for north, south, north, south, north, south, north, south. And you know, you can imagine doing these things by hand. So they made a substitution. They said, well, this dipole string is the same as a big north on this end and a big south on that end. It seems completely reasonable, right? Just one little small problem. I do experimental physics. And when I started using just a big N on one end and a big S on the other end, none of my calculations matched my experiment. I thought my experiment was wrong. No, it wasn't my experiment was wrong. My modeling was wrong. As soon as I put all these extra north-south in, my uh, modeling matched my experiment. OK, so back to our thousands and thousands of little dipoles making a permanent magnet. OK, electric current. This is where it's going to get a little bit more interesting. OK, most people know the right-hand rule. You point your thumb in the direction of the current, and your fingers show the B field lines. OK. Now, the speed field of electric current goes in a circle. Uh, it's also called a radial transverse or tangential. Uh, most of the stuff, if you read it from the 1800s, says radial transverse. Uh, now, how could we make a circle of magnetism? Well, we could just take our dipole chain. And we'll put one this direction, one that direction, one that direction, that one direction. It's a closed loop. So we have our dipole chain. And let me grab another prop. Magnetism of a dipole ring. I give you a dipole ring. Think about this. If I open it, I have a traditional magnet, which is pretty strong. If I close it, I greatly weaken, weaken it because the, you know it's going all the way around. But it's still this magnetism. You know, if you start at a certain point, you go around, around, and around. It goes around, around forever. Now, even though this is weaker than it was before, it's still a magnet. It still holds. So it still has a feel. OK, another dipole ring. Now, real world, real world data. This is a wire uh, carrying current. And we have iron filings. And hey, those iron filings are in circles. Now, I wonder how that happened. This should be self-evident. Every iron filing is an induced dipole. As soon as you put it in the field, the, the iron the ferromagnetic uh, material becomes an di induced dipole it aligns itself in a circle. Oh, let's go back one. The current in the wire must be the same thing, because it's a circle. So the only way to get that is having dipole rings stacked on each other. And that will produce a uh, radial transverse field. Now. Uh, Here's a video, and I'll go ahead and take questions while the video is playing. Any questions? Okay. So one, I'll go ahead and create a question. Why haven't you seen this before? And the answer is, I'll start the video again. The answer is why you haven't seen this before is this approximation. The big north, big south. Notice there's no way to make a big north and a big south to go in a circle. So you really have to go back to a dipole chain to make this work. I'll let the video play now. Well, we're looking at a wire carrying current. And the little white dots, OK, earlier I basically was showing a static B field. The problem with showing the static B field in this video is it would just be big circles. You wouldn't see anything. The whole thing would be white. So what I did was I put a bunch of magnetic dipole rings, and I told the computer to plot the fields around the dipole ring. 
and when it calculates the fields around the dipole rings and puts the, the uh, B field lines into the, uh, from the program, they go in circles, which should be completely uh, obvious. So we're looking at, you know, I'm taking this data set, I'm giving it to POV Ray, and POV Ray is saying, hey, these fields look like circles. Or actually, it's your brain saying it looks like circles. POV Ray doesn't care. Now, I could let this video play, but I only have a limited amount of time, and uh, I'm sure you guys don't want to see everything. It's online. Oh, right here. Two attract each other. See the uh, two, uh, I'm going to show that to you later, but basically one dipole is opposite the other dipole. And when, where you have a north, you have a south, and where you have a south, you have a north, and they pull each other together. And then when they repel, you'll have north versus north and south versus south, and it pushes it away. Okay, this is online. Uh, I have a YouTube channel, so there shouldn't be any problem finding this. I'm going to go ahead and go on. Okay. I know we have some programmers in here, so maybe, uh, maybe we can look at some, a little bit of math and a little bit of programming. Okay. I use, I use this equation. This is Coulomb's Law. Uh, now, most of you probably would not see this unless you were doing computer programming. But basically it says I have a charge at X location X1, I have a charge at location X2, and we're just looking at this. Uh, we're figuring out the force, and it's times some constant right there. Now, how to check this? If we, if we say Y1 equals Y2, Z1 equals Z2, then you'll see these go to zero, that goes to zero, everything goes to zero except for this bottom equation. So x1 minus x2, x1 minus x2 squared, raised to 3 over 2 power. And if we simplify the powers, it drops down uh, to the direction of x, x1 minus x2 squared. We'll say let r equal x1 minus x2, and we'll end up with 1 over r squared. Hey, it's inverse square law. Now, which inverse square law is this? Well, it really doesn't matter because all inverse square laws use the same math. You know, gravity is 1 over r squared. Um, magnetism is 1 over r squared. Electric is 1 over r, r squared. So this single equation can be used for all three forces. Now this k, that's your constant. Now remember we said gravity is a lot weaker than magnetism. So when we're talking about gravity, this k is very small. We were talking about magnetism, this K is very large, and so forth. Yes, the reason being anything that's 1 over R squared, remember that mechanical waves yeah. come from that's inverse I square laws. That's what I yeah, so yeah, anything. Anything that deals with physics in the inverse square is, you can use this equation for. Okay, so this is a video card. This is an NVIDIA video card. This is a low level logical drawing. You can see the L1 cache, the L2 cache, the front side bus. The SP is stream processors, I believe. And NVIDIA video cards have anywhere from, you know, they used to have hundreds of video. Uh, hundreds of processors, and now they have thousands of processors, recent, recent, recent uh, re releases. Okay, luckily we don't have a program at this level. What we program is at a logical level, we make a kernel, and every kernel has a grid, and inside that grid there's blocks, and inside the blocks are threads. So this is your standard, you know, one thing inside another thing inside another thing, logical, pro you know, uh, layout. Uh, I should stress that when you're using video cards, every program, every thread has the same program. Uh, you know, it's, uh, think of a million not larynx next to each other. Absolutely. But basically we have thousands and thousands of threads running at the same time. Now the only information 
that they're given is each thread can say, what's my ID? And they'll say, oh, your X ID is one, your Y ID is three, and your block ID, and so forth. So when a program starts on a thread, it says, who am I? And it says, well, your name is not Larry. And then not Larry looks up what he does in this program, and that thread continues. OK. So in order to fix a problem, uh, in order to uh, have a solution, first you must have a problem. Now here's my problem. Any memory location not on the Celcon, not on the NVIDIA cell, uh, video chip, there's 100 times longer to access the memory. See where it says 100x? So if I just declare a regular integer, then, and I try to read that integer, it takes me 100 times, to, uh, 100 times longer than reading a register on the same chip. So if I declare uh, a variable, which is a register, then it's only 1x. Now the problem being, there's only so many registers on the chip. So you know you, you have a trade-off speed versus storage. So how I fixed this problem was I made it bigger. I said, well, no, leave my x1 location alone. But x2 can be anywhere along a certain vector with a certain spacing. So um, no, I have a spacing of a. We have it. I don't know if you guys can see it from there. But I have n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 2. And if we plug this into the equation, we can get a line of discrete charge, sorry, a line of discrete charges. And if I take this equation and I expand it, and then I get these substitutions, which there's no, there, there is a rhyme and reason to them, but there, you know, it's just a bunch of substitutions. And then I end up with this equation. Now, what's so special about this equation? Well, 50 years ago, it would mean nothing because it's, you know, I'm just rewriting Coulomb's law. But now it means something because my x location is a constant. My a location, or my a is a constant. My y, my b, my z, my c, my s4, my s7, and s8 are all constants, which means I never have to read uh, main memory. Everything I need to calculate is a one, is in register memory, and I never go to the memory bus, therefore I can run this very, very quickly. This is called you know, a discrete line of discrete charges. OK, a little bit of programming. I won't get into this. If anybody wants to talk about this, I'll bring it up later. Um, I'll show you some interesting spots. This is where it figures out who it is. You know, your program starts, and it says, who am I? And then it's, and they can ask, what's my block ID? What's my dimensions? What's my thread ID? And this calculates a pointer to a main memory. <laughs> It pulls this information in from main memory. Oh, by the way, you know, that 100x, yes, it takes a long time to read main memory, but if you bunch your memories, or your memory reads together, then you, you get those for free. So the first one is fast, or, or the first one is slow, but, you know, up to 256 bytes, which is the size of the bus, you get all those at the same time. So it's very good to read main memory all at once which hide, hides your latency. OK. Right here, this is a special entry. It says sync threads, which basically says all threads stop what you're doing. And it says, if my thread ID equals 0, then do these special commands. And all, what these are just special reads. It puts it into shared memory, which is on the chip. And then after it puts all this information information is a shared memory, then it says sync threads again, which basically restarts all the threads. So this is like a timeout. You know, everybody stop what you're doing, you do this, then it says, well, after you're done, everybody start it again. And the magic thing about shared memory is every thread can read it at the silicon speed. Okay, just more housekeeping. This is the money shot of everything I've shown you. This is actually where it all comes together. This little loop, assume this line goes on for 20,000 charges. This loop executes 20,000 times. Uh, floating point absolute, so there, uh, absolute floating point is in silicon. It's a silicon function. The greater than zero is in the silicon. It's a silicon function. 
inverse square root, again, silicon. It's, it's in the silicon. Reciprocal, it's in the silicon. Everything in this loop is programmed in the silicon. So I'm basically running, now if it takes 100 clock cycles to read a memory location, each one of these silicon operations are six clock cycles. So this thing can literally run faster than you can read from main memory. And, and you know, if, you, if you're doing 20,000 charges, it happens faster than you can hit the enter key, basically. OK, so more stuff. And that's the end of the modeling. And I'm glad I have this many people that made it through it. OK. I have a question. Sure. I haven't went that far with it, but absolutely in the middle of the ring is zero. It has to be. Because the ring, well, with, with, if the ring was continuous, it would be zero. But because I'm using discrete charges, you might get a little leftover result in the middle, but it would not be very large. Yes. This is actually for my benefit. It's, it's, not working, it's not working against me. I want to use shared memory because all the threads can talk to the shared memory at once. There, there's no conflicts. There's no, uh, I'm trying to think what the name of that is. Uh, so it's, it's all running. A non-blocking switch no, would mean the, a swi the shared memory is non-blocking. So what I do is I take all the stuff that I need I read it at once, yeah. and I stick it into non-blocking memory, and all, then, all, then I say start, and all the threads can access it as needed. Oh, so you're only doing this the first time, but you're not doing Yeah, it. this is priming the pump. Oh, okay. Then we're letting the pump run. No, once the threads start, they're, they're gone. They, they do their thing, and they, they don't stop. In fact, you can see this. This is a accumulator. It's basically just yeah. adding up. And at the end, it sticks it into QLM and so forth. Any other questions? OK. So now we'll talk about my experimental work. And uh, this should go quickly. Uh, I run a company called Revolution Labs. I make ferrofluid cells. There will be one as a demonstration tonight in the ninth floor. Um, everybody's welcome to come there and try it. You know, you literally can hold a magnet in your hand and look at these fields. Uh, uh, this slide's from like 2006. I won't use this terminology anymore, but we'll go ahead and go with it. A uh, Hillshaw cell is uh, two pieces of glass and have, have ferrofluid between the two pieces of glass. The ferrofluid is just a bunch of dipoles inside a fluid, and it has electrostatics and charges to stop them from sticking together. And the lens is basically uh, my ferrofluid lens, which is what my company's about. This is probably from 2007. I have a lens here. My lens has a bunch of LED lights around it. I have a permanent magnet in front of it. Inside the box, by the way, this is a real low cost experimentation. If you <laughs> hey, my advisor was very happy to support me on this one. <laughs> it didn't cost them anything. Uh, I have a camera inside which is computer controlled, and when, it, you know, when I see the image I like, I basically hit a button and the camera takes a picture. And this is my apparatus, you know, glass sandwich with ferrofluid inside it, and a bunch of LEDs around the perimeter. Uh, some early stuff. Uh, I sell these now, and they look much better than this. <laughs> and I'm actually getting a 3D printer, and I'm going to start making these using a 3D printer, which should make it look much better. Right now, it looks like some grad student made one. OK, so in 2006, I'm an undergrad, and I get these pictures. And if you'll see, now this is real low power LEDs. Uh, I use much higher, stronger stuff nowadays. You'll see that 
You know, remember we were talking about dipoles and permanent mag magnets of dipoles. So on one hand, I have a dipole rotating counterclockwise, and this one I have a dipole uh, flipping in over in. And you can imagine being an undergrad getting pictures like this, and the professor's looking at them. Uh, what is that? I don't know. <laughs> uh, then this is a little bit later. Uh, 150 millimeter ferrofluid lens, bunch of LEDs, permanent magnet. Now we know, you know, dipole. We're looking at one end of a pole, or a dipole, so this is a pole. And you'll see the light is spinning around it. Sure. No, only because of strength problems. These permanent magnets, I only can use permanent magnets because they're strong, they're in a Tesla range, which is about 2,000 gauss at the field. So yeah, if these were, you know, 1,000 years from now, when they really developed this technology, the answer is yes. But right now, there's just too weak. So you'll notice that this thing's real time, and the, the light is following the magnet. There's my dipole again, north, south. No. I hope all this is coming together to you. You know, why did I learn how to model magnetism? Because my experiment made me learn how to model it. And why did I start using dipole strings instead of single dipoles? Because none of my pictures match these unless I use dipole strings. Okay, this goes on for a while. Okay, here's some pictures. This is a single magnet on its side, which would be a dipole. This is three uh, magnets, uh, north, 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 south, south, south. And notice how the poles join together. See, magnetism is very complicated. Uh, it's one of the reasons it's still not modeled like it should be is because, now, how do you model three poles joining together? It, it, you know, it gets a little bit complicated. OK, so if this is complicated, what is that, <laughs> basically? I have a north-south, I have a south-north. Basically, I've twisted the field, and we will see lines crossing that twisting, and go, they go from like a north to a north and a south to a south. So I got a little X, X going on there. Uh, same story, one more magnet. So north-south-north, south-north-south. So the, basically, let's go back. The same picture, except for the center magnet is flipped. And when that happens, it creates these two nodes that show up. And all the lines run through the nodes, which uh, you, you can imagine is pretty interesting. Questions? So in the previous one, you just have a four magnet magnet ring. Uh, this one is just three magnets. No, no, uh, three, one, four. Yeah, that guy. Oh, that's, just your that's two. That's two. That's a north-south on one side and a south-north on the other. Yes? I don't have any pictures in my slide, but basically you just have little islands of light that show up. And just a little, it, it literally looks like a, just a stray field. Yes? The color vision is LEDs for us. Is that The LED, uh, early on I tried lasers, and lasers just didn't work. Uh, this apparatus likes wide field or wide dispersal LEDs. So the more light I can pump in there, the better the image you can Comes. Any others? Oh, the colors. Okay, you imagine being an undergrad student, and you come up with a picture like this, but it's all in color. And they say, well, that's just a uh, diffraction pattern. You didn't do anything. That's a diffraction pattern. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> so I went back and put colored LEDs in and showed that they were actually going side to side. No. There is no diffraction pattern. It goes from left to right in this kind of uh, apparatus. Or at least that's what I can believe. OK. Uh, any others? I have a question, but it's not about the okay. uh, Can you save it to the end? Yeah. OK. OK, so let's go ahead and finish this. Uh, this is where I started, uh, you know, I, uh, using uh, MATLAB. And I said, well, MATLAB, I started using my little dipole tricks. And 
you'll notice that when I have a north, south, south, north, north, south, I do have these little, uh, they call them saddles, uh, hyperbolic saddles that show up. And the image, these little nodes are exactly the same spot. So, you know, this is one of those cases where experimental, experimental uh, evidence matches the calculation. Oh, this to make things fun. My LEDs never make four lines. They never make three lines. They, either, they make either zero, one, or two. Now, if they make two lines and you have a field that twists itself, you'll see the two lines come together, twist around each other, go through the hyperbolic saddle point, come out the other side and untwist. And I can prove that they come from a single LED because I never have a green twist. No, my pattern is uh, green, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red. Uh, I never have green twist around red or blue twist around green. It's always red around red, blue around blue, and so forth. So each one of these pairs come from a single LED. Uh, and just to make things funner, If you take a ring magnet, which is magnetized through the thickness, it's very hard to model, which explains why I started modeling. But uh, if you take a ring magnet and put it next to my ferrofluid cell, you get a spirograph. How the hell you get a spirograph, I don't know. I've only studied it for five years. I still don't know. <laughs> OK, so we get our spirographs. So that's a two-inch ring. That's my fingertips and my hand. And that's uh, uh, actually submitted this to a uh, art contest as uh, a handy spirograph. As a close-up, that's two together. And this is one is north-south. OK. If I do the calculation of these ring magnets, they tell me the center points come closer together when they're, when they're attractive. And literally, you can see that the, my center points are actually moving in from the, from the centers of the magnets. The next one's the opposite. This was in north-north, and you see that my center points of the rings have moved out. They've moved away from each other, which is good because that matches my math. Also, we have this nice little feature in the middle. I, I can't explain it. Uh, but, you know, it makes a pretty butterfly. Yeah. Oh, well, mathematically it's there. But I, but I don't know why this light, remember this light's coming into the cell and bouncing around and bouncing to the camera. And then you're getting the picture, of the, you know, the image is going to the camera. And it just chooses not to go to that point. Singularity, yes, absolutely. So here's a three-inch one. Oh, yeah, it gets more, in, more interesting. Uh, you take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland. You take the blue pill, and you see how far this rabbit hole goes. goes. OK, this is an eight-magnet uh, configuration that I made for my thesis. Uh, these things are very strong, and I was putting a jig together. And my goal was to make a uniform field. And there's a way to use eight magnets to make a uniform field. I screwed up. <laughs> one of my alignments was wrong, and I never fixed it for this reason. Each one takes about 20 pounds force to put into the jig, and it makes it harder to put the next one in. Now, I'm a pretty strong guy, but when I got to magnets number seven and number eight, I literally was using all my strength to get it into the jig. And once it went into the jig, I wasn't changing it. Uh, just too much energy that's like, like a big spring. So where I should have had using, this is a, I can't say the name, high block. It's a Japanese name, and he came up with a way to make a uniform field using permanent magnets. Anyway, I got one wrong. Uh, if you do the calculation, it looks like this. This is a 3D contour plot. It's basically my potential energy from earlier. And you can see how far, far I've come. I used to ca calculate potential energy like this. And now I calculate potential energy for 3D space. So this is what it looks like in two and a half uh, sp uh, degree space. 
And if we go one more, this is just a contour plot of the potential energy, the same thing as before. And the real picture? That's what I saw at 2 o'clock in the morning when I was working on my thesis. I saw my experiment staring back at me. Uh, and I don't, I don't know if you guys have ever worked in a basement of a physics building, but it's pretty spooky at 2 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah we, we, didn't see, we didn't see the light very often. Okay. So the biggest question, and, oh, there's a little, talk about little magic points. There's a little um, flaw in the glass, and this, you know, it's a little bubble in the glass. And they, you know, this came that way. And that bubble is reflecting light that's being transmitted in the glass. So it's, it's just basically causing a little error in, you know, what you normally would see. But see this little error, this little spot, which is reflecting light. The light gets bent right next to the flaw. And you know, you couldn't dream of doing this experiment. I would have never dreamed of putting a glass bubble in the glass to see what was happening. So if I can explain why this is happening, this is applied field, this is no field, then my answer, then, then life is good. Unfortunately, uh, this was a list of everything we were trying to rule out. I could go on for hours about this list, but I won't. But uh, this is everything I had to consider. But what happened to me? And this is where the story gets interesting. And it actually kind of applies to this group, too. My advisor told me that they only can do research for things they understand. I took this highly personally. I'm like, how in the hell can you have something that looks like that? which has never been seen on the face of the earth in the last 3,000 or 4,000 years, and not want to study it. And, uh, you know, it probably took me six months to realize my advisor was right. And here's why. When you apply for funding, you know, you're doing a, a grant application. There's 40 pages to the grant application. 20 pages of that grant application is asking, you know, what do you want to study, how much money do you want, and how does it work? I don't know how it works. That's the reason I want to study it. You, do you see this loop that goes on? So in most of our research universities, the only things that get study, studied are, thing, are grants that can make it through some bureaucrat who doesn't want to lose his job. He doesn't want to waste the taxpayer's money. So he picks the sure choices. And the sure choices are the ones that they understand. So even though I took it personally, it turns out that's how the system really works. Now, how does that apply to us? Sure. Well, how do they learn anything new? I think I made that point to my advisor. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yeah, that's, that was my exact point. You know, if Newton would have had that viewpoint, we would still be, you know, <laughs> We wouldn't even have any of the gravitational laws. So, but this is how the system works. So it turns out that people in this room are much more creative than any university. There's just no funding. You know, you go to university, they spend eight years beating the creativeness out of you. <laughs> and then they say, we want you to be creative. But hold it, you just spent eight years making everybody conform. And so when we're talking about a hacker convention, we're talking about people can, that can actually think and not be conformists. So that's, that's a good thing about those hackers. Oh, so I didn't get funding. And I know lots of people that would be mad and you know, want to burn the place down and say every bad wor word in the world. You know, can you imagine Will Pig if he didn't get funded? That'd be a bad scene. I, um, I, I didn't have any choice, so I started working on my modeling. And it turns out my modeling is probably just as good as my research because nobody's done it before. So, you know, life sometimes life throws things at us and we think we're getting screwed, but in some ways it's actually working for our benefit. Now, funny story of how this turns out. 
I had submitted a photo to APS. And if anybody knows what the APS is, that's the American Physical Society. And it basically takes over the whole world with physics. There's no other societies that match it. It's dominant. And they put one of my photo photographs on their website. So far, so good. I signed a, a blanket agreement so they could use it. They added it to one of their libraries, and I forgot about it. So imagine that was in 2010. I didn't get funding. In 2011, this shows up at one of the conventions. A graphics artist at APS grabbed one of my images and put it on the March meeting poster. This poster was seen around the world. So you have a guy who can't get an extra dollar to look at an experiment, and the whole world has seen my, my work. So you know, you know, karma's kind of an interesting thing, isn't it? So I'm actually quite happy that this happened. And that's it. Other questions? Superconductor would, but remember, superconductors are very cold. So what's happening, and it's a little bit outside my experience, but what's happening is those dipoles are easily frozen into place. And if they're easily frozen into the place, then you have very low thermal energy, which is kind of circle what I just said. But you have a very, uh, very low resistance, and that's why they call it the superconductor. So we're just talking about a different treatment of, you know, our permanent magnet idea. But now we're doing, doing it at a different temperature range. And if I understand it right, the gradual fading of magnetic media because random thermal effects are gradually reorienting the I agree. individual atoms. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's it make their, no, sooner or later, how we made this was we applied a field and we froze it in the space, into place. And if I take a hammer to it, then those domains can go back to random. And when they go back to random, then we can't measure the magnetism anymore. But a very important thing is that magnetism's still there because electrons have magnetism. You never get away from it. What you just end up doing is in the macro world, you can't measure it anymore. But if you have something... I'll go back to one of the first images. Uh, take a second. If you have, uh, yeah, there we go. How this is done, this picture here, is is a very very small probe. It's an atomic force. Uh, I can't say the word, but it's this atomic force probe. And it has a little tiny magnet on the end. And they drag it over the surface. And the little tiny magnet has forces applied to it, which they can measure. So this image is made by the near, near field of a bunch of random domains. If you would go out even, you know, 500 millimeters, or just, that's huge, uh, if you would go away one millimeter, you would never read this. It would just be a, a blur. So when you get to micro world size, this film doesn't have, this does not have a magnetic field. Of course it does, you just can't see it. Yes? Right. When I turn off this field here, is there a way to measure the time that you're able to, to, to detect that I've turned it off? Meaning, is it instantaneous at both ends, or is it like light, where we can sort of It's the absolutely like light. All inverse squ uh, square fields propagate at the speed of light. And that's, that has huge impacts in our physics, or the, the di di dynamic physics. Mostly what I talked about today was static physics, but when you start talking about dynamic physics, that speed of light uh, 
latency from net, you know, us network guys, we would say latency. That latency effect really has effects. It changes the whole world. Anybody else? Yes? Slightly off topic, but um, why does stainless steel not magnetize very well? Well, it's because, see, that's the mis misconception. It's not that it's not magnetizing very well. It's that, you know, the electrons, you know, it, of course, is, you know, back to the electron cloud, the electrons are free to rotate. So when you have something like stainless steel, the spin up can immediately become spin down and counteract the magnetism. So it looks like it's not responding, but what's really happening is all the electrons in there say, are basically saying, screw you, we don't want to be magnetized. And they flip. Why does that happen with stainless? Uh, it's, there's three or four things going on. One is the softness of the material and allowing the domains to shift. The other thing is if the molecules themselves have certain kinds of electrons, uh, just thinking about the D layer, uh, it's a little bit outside of my field, but you know you have different orbitals, and the effect of uh, applied field to those different orbitals of the molecules can be different depending on how you make them. So you have one case where they don't respond; they look like they don't respond, but what they're really doing is canceling. You have another case with ferromagnetism that goes the other direction. They like going, you know, the electrons and the ferromagnetic materials like going along with the, uh, the crowd that they can form. So uh, stainless steel is just filled with nonconformists, basically. When you magnetize it, you screw up the material that likes it. Right. And if it's below its curry temperature, it will stay magnetized. And if it's above its curry temperature, it will, the thermal, violate, uh, thermal uh, variations will just break it apart. You know, you always have this thermal thing going on where they're bumping into each other and changing their alignments. So would that come from a mix of metals that go into stainless versus the straight iron, for example? Yes. Other, any other questions? Well, I want to thank you for being my audience. And I'm very impressed that I had this many people stay with me. Uh, if we would have had some quantum people in here, they would have ran out screaming, <laughs> holding their heads. Uh, you know, it, it's really amazing, but if you challenge anybody's worldview, you can get some interesting results. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much.